Hello, everybody. Six o'clock. It's uh, welcome to the March meeting in the nonprofit uh, plant based nutrition organization of Wisconsin, or PB now. I'm your host, Terry Lynch. The mission of our nonprofit group is to educate, inspire, and support each other on an evidence backed whole food plant based nutritional path for health and improved quality of life. Our group is open to everyone, those plant based and those just curious about it. Uh, it's meant to be a non-judgmental place for people to come get information, inspiration, and support. If you'd like more information about our group or our upcoming meeting dates, speakers, and resources, you can go to our website, pbnow.org or pbnow.org, or find us on Facebook or Instagram. Um, as we do each time, can I see a show of hands of uh, either by raising your hand or by using the thumbs up icon reaction icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen to show how many of you are currently uh, plant following a plant-based lifestyle. A lot of thumbs up coming out, a lot of hands there. That's great. That looks like over half at this point in this time, which is, it's great. Um, as we mentioned at the beginning of each meeting, the evidence of the benefits of plant-based nutrition in improving health and quality of life for people of all ages, as published in non-biased medical research is quite striking. Uh, whether it's improving health through increased energy, weight loss, preventing slowing, stopping or reversing problems like allergies, digestive problems, diabetes, heart disease, and early dementia, or increasing our quality of life by helping us feel better quickly, strengthening our immune system, increasing our endurance, improving athletic performance, speeding recovery time from exercise, reducing joint pain, clearing our thinking, or reducing the physical, emotional, and financial side effects of the illnesses, drugs, and procedures often recommended to treat the conditions plant-based nutrition can help us avoid. The research shows our bodies do a wonderful job of healing themselves if we stop damaging them daily with poor nutrition and start giving them the nutrition they need and were designed to uh, live on to heal and function optimally. It's truly remarkable. Now, let me tell you what's in store for you tonight. Tonight, we're going to hear from three speakers. First, we'll hear comments from our PBNL medical director, cardiologist, Dr. Joshua Liberman. Next, plant-based cook, Amberly Childs. We'll talk uh, snack and appetizer ideas for March Madness. And at that time, we encourage you to share any of your own favorite plant-based snack and our appetizer ideas with the group. Uh, Amber, you can uh, put, you can go into the chat box and then Amberly can call on you. Uh, and after Amberly, we'll hear our featured speaker, plant-based icon, Dr. Michael Clapper. We should have 15 to 20 minutes left for Q&A after Dr. Clapper's talk. And our program should end by 7.30. As a reminder, we have meetings every month, usually on the second Thursday of the month at 6 p.m. Next month, we'll hear from Denver cardiologist, Dr. Andrew Freeman, with his annual update on the most important plant-based research published in the past year. In May, we'll hear from another plant-based icon, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn. Once again, you can find out more information about our upcoming meetings on our website, pbnow.org. And if you register on the website, you receive email reminders of our events as they approach. A uh, quick technical note during the meeting, everybody but the speakers will be muted. And we ask that you stay that way just to avoid background noise and to allow everybody to hear the speakers. Uh, you can use the chat box for questions uh, when we do, or for participation during the, uh, uh, when Amberly is speaking and we're talking about recipes. All right, here we go. Our first speaker is a fellowship trained cardiologist practicing cardiology at, at Columbia uh, at St. Mary's, Ascension Columbia, St. Mary's here in Milwaukee. He is past president and current trustee of the Wisconsin chapter of the American College of Cardiology. He's a member of the American Car uh, College of Cardiology's Nas National Prevention Work Group, whose membership includes nationally known physicians such as Dr. Dean Ornish, Dr. Esselstyn, and Dr. Bernard. He's an advocate for the use of plant-based nutrition to help improve heart health, general health, and quality of life 
and has seen the benefits of plant-based nutrition in both his personal life and that of his patients. We're fortunate to have him practicing here in Milwaukee. I can say that personally in our PBNL and as our PBNL medical director. I'm happy to welcome tonight, Dr. Joshua Liberman. Dr. Liberman. Thanks, Harry. As always, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I am really happy to be part of this, uh, this group and part of be happy to be on this, uh, this Zoom call right now. Uh, hopefully we're gonna get to a point not too soon, you know, not too far from now where we can start doing these in person again and getting back to community. Um, that's obviously something that's important for, uh, for health, for, for heart health, for mental health is to, is to be part of a community and to, you know, and to, uh, and to be present with other people. So hopefully it won't be too long uh, with, with all the numbers coming down. Uh, I, think, I think maybe this is gonna be our year. Um, <clears throat> it's nice to see so many people on the call. It's, uh, it's definitely, uh, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, heartening. Uh, to see so many people on the call interested in, uh, in hearing what, what, what Dr. Clapper has to say. Um, uh, certainly, it, sound, it seems like the numbers are more, are more than when, I have, when I'm talking, so, uh, so kudos to you. And uh, I guess I need to start stepping up my game a little bit. Um, so as you guys know, um, I usually try to talk about um, so, you know, some, some uh, you know, personal experience uh, from my practice. Uh, with, uh, with plant-based diets and, and the effect that they can have on, on heart health. And almost every week, you know, I have a patient who's coming back to me uh, after starting the journey or, or, is, or I'm just meeting for the first time and, is, and, and we talk about the journey. Uh, this week, I had a really nice uh, um, a case that, that kind of epitomizes the, the benefits, encapsulates the benefits of, of moving to a plant-based diet. Um, this was a 49-year-old South Asian male, so right, so South Asia, you know, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, that kind of, those, those, those that area, and many of you may not know, uh, but, it, but it turns out that there's a very, very high rate of, of heart disease in South Asia, and, and, and you can say, well, that's strange, because, you know, aren't, you know, aren't uh, a large portion of people on, on the subcontinent there uh, vegetarian, and it is true, <clears throat> I mean, not so much vegan, but vegetarian, they, they do cook with a lot of clarified butter or ghee, <clears throat> And, um, and so it's a well-known phenomenon that people can outwardly look healthy, you know, look fairly lean, uh, but, but metabolically, biochemically, they can have actually very, very high risk. And they have oftentimes have what we call metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance or these kinds of things. And so sure enough, this, uh, this gentleman came to see me, he's 49 years old, um, and, uh, and he was referred by his primary because his triglycerides, which are functionally just fat particles floating through the bloodstream, his triglycerides were 1900. So as a reference point, you know, uh, we, we consider quote unquote normal, or I shouldn't say normal, we should we consider acceptable up to 150. Um, but that's not really normal, probably normal for the human being is really in the 60 to 80 range. Um, to, uh, you know, if you're if you're truly eating a healthy diet, and if you're a healthy individual, um, but we accept up to 150. Well, this guy's were 1900. Um, and you know, he, he wasn't like, you know, uh, uh, you know, going to, to Culver's on a nightly basis, you know, or, or, you know, eating, eating tubs of custard on, you know, every day or anything like that. Um, he also had, uh, unfortunately, he had uncontrolled diabetes. So his, his A1C, which is the way we measure diabetes, was up to 8.4, 8.4%. And so I guess a, a rough way you could think of that um, is that 8.4% uh, of his blood was, was, was sugar. It's not really exactly true. Uh, the way you think of it, but it's an easy way to think of it. Uh, and normal is to be under 5.7%. So um, your, your blood should really no normally not be more than 5.7% sugar, and his was 8.4%. So of course, uh, we talked about options, we talked about medical therapy, I mean, that's mostly what, uh, what he was sent to me for was, was the, you know, was, was the plan was obviously, um, uh, you know, oh, just put this guy on medications, I'm going to send you to the cardiologist and, and, and he'll get you better. But, you know, we talked about other ways uh, of, 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 of achieving our goals. And, you know, and he was interested. He, he, he definitely, you know, was, um, I wouldn't say that he was reluctant to be on medications, but he definitely wanted to know if there was an alternative way. And so we talked about moving to a plant-based diet. Um, he was already, you know, mostly vegetarian at the time. But as I said, um, cooking with a lot of basically cream, you know, it's like heavy cream is what he is kind of in a way. Um, and so he, uh, you know, got rid of fried food. He got rid of the ghee. Uh, he started really eating a, an extra, a, a much healthier diet, and he started uh, doing a little bit of exercise—not a tremendous amount, but a little bit of exercise. And when so, when I saw him back, 
Um, his triglycerides were normal, right? So they went from 1900 to normal, amazing. Uh, and his A1C in, in just, it was like just over three months had gone from 8.4% down to 6.3%. So again, still elevated, but I mean, you know, a, 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 a greater than 2 percentage point drop in just three months is just, is just really phenomenal. Um, and so again, I think that that just highlights that um, when people make a uh, commitment, right, when, when they really put a mind, their mind to it, um, there, there's tremendous benefits for, for making a decision like this to go to, a, you know, a plant-based diet. Um, and so, as you know, I also like to talk about a little bit of research. And again, I don't want to take up too much time because I want Amberly to have a chance to speak. And of course, we all want to hear from Dr. Clapper. Um, but, but in this line of thought about the diabetes, we know there's a lot of evidence that that plant-based diets really are, are extremely beneficial specifically for diabetes. Not only, not exclusively for diabetes, but boy, they give such a tremendous benefit for patients with diabetes. And so, you know, in, in preparation for this, uh, for this talk tonight, I, you know, want to do a little research just on, on the topic of diabetes since I was thinking about it. It was top of mind um, with this recent patient. And you know, there, there's at least 25 to 30 studies in, in the last decade alone uh, that have shown um, that, uh, that, that plant-based diets, that I should say that meat intake is related to type 2 diabetes risk, meaning the more meat you take in, whether it's processed meat, whether it's unprocessed meat, whether it's, you know, red meat, all, all, the, all these forms of meat, total meat, you know, any way you kind of calculate it, any way you quantify it, um, we know that meat intake is related to, to diabetes risk. Um, certainly there was a, uh, just looking through the list of things, there was a, a 2013 meta-analysis. Um, that, so that's a, a kind of a, um, a grouping together of lots of smaller studies uh, to try to see if, the, if there's a stronger signal uh, or, or if there are themes that, that the other studies uh, are, are, are pointing towards. And certainly there was, there was a large meta-analysis in 2013 that, that showed that um, type 2 diabetes risk was related to higher rates of, of, of total meat. Um, we know that it's not just the fat content of the meat. So I had a patient this week ask, saying, oh, well, I, I eat meat, but it's, it's only extra lean. Isn't that okay? Because, you know, then I, you know, it's, it's all low fat. And of course, it's not just the fat content of the meat. That's the issue. It's the heme iron. Um, it's, uh, it's, you know, sometimes it's, it's the nitrates, uh, especially if it's, in, if it's processed meat. Um, but we know that, that heme iron intake from red meat is related to risk of type 2 diabetes and high serum ferritin levels, which is a protein that carries uh, iron, are associated with insulin resistance, uh, and type 2 diabetes. Um, also just, you know, protein intake. So, uh, you know, people are always talking about, oh, well, I, I need to eat meat because uh, that's where I get my protein from, right? Which is, again, a whole bunch of bunk. But, um, but we know that higher levels of protein, especially specifically animal sources of protein, are related to increased risk of type 2 diabetes, whereas moderate plant protein intake uh, was associated with a decreased risk of diabetes. Um, and we know that uh, there, there's also studies that show that replacing animal protein with plant protein, um, you know, aiming for, you know, uh, you know, well, whatever, replacing animal protein with plant protein will reduce your A1C, will reduce your fasting glucose, will reduce fasting insulin levels. And that's what this patient that I just saw this week, uh, you know, exhibited, you know, he, he, he changed his, his source of protein um, and I mean, changed other things too, but he changed the source of protein. And sure enough, his A1C came down uh, and, and everything got better. So, um, Lots of benefits, obviously, to plant-based diets, uh, but specifically, you know, in this in this case, uh, diabetes risk, because uh, this guy dramatically, dramatically lowered his diabetes risk. And technically, he's no longer in, he no longer has diabetes. He's just in the borderline diabetes range, which is which was really wonderful news to share with him. So, with that, thank you all, and uh, appreciate the uh, appreciate you being on board. Thank you, Dr. Liberman. That's uh, fascinating. What a wonderful uh, story for that individual. Uh, our, our next speaker tonight is a uh, plant-based cook, familiar to many of you. She's the founder and operator of the Milwaukee company Plant Joy, through which she teaches plant-based cooking classes and offers an ever-expanding menu of uh, pickup or home-delivered plant-based meals, providing an easy way for people to incorporate plant-based nutrition into their daily lives. You can find more specific, specific information about her Plant Joy um, at plantjoy.net. Uh, she was trained and certified as a plant-based cooking instructor in the Food for Life program run by Dr. Bernard's uh, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine in Washington, D.C. There are a number of Food for Life 
certified instructors in the country, but many areas of the country do not have the luxury of having one nearby. We not only have one here in Milwaukee, but she is excellent. I'm happy to welcome plant-based cook and cooking instructor, Amberly Childs. Amberly. Hi, Terry. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. Good to see you all. Um, hopefully we've uh, gotten through the brunt of winter, fingers crossed, right? Um, it's nice to almost be in spring. And for me being a chef, it's, uh, it's new ingredient time. Um, so it means new things will start to um, come out of the ground and um, new varieties will be available. And um, you all can hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and so um, I wanted to share a recipe tonight. One of the things Terry and I were talking about was, you know, what are some kind of like appetizers and snacks? We've got lots of TV time coming up. We're, we're as, as we start to kind of come out a little bit of our shells from this pandemic, we start to go to a friend's house and maybe it's bring a dish or, um, and so we're starting to kind of move back into these social um, areas where we habitate together and, and, oh no, what do I do? What do I cook? What do I bring? What do I eat? And, um, and so here we are. Um, so one of the things that I love is a good spring roll or egg roll. Um, minus the egg, obviously. Um, but we put lots of things in them, but they're kind of known as egg rolls because they are crunchy on the outside. If you have an air fryer, the recipe I'm going to share with you can be interchanged to be a mock fried egg roll with vegetables in it. You could did simply change the spring roll, the rice on um, the rice paper. You could exchange the rice paper for an egg roll wrapper. And that's actually made out of wheat. So if you're gluten-free, you don't wanna do that. Gluten-free, you wanna stick with the um, rice wrapper that we are suggesting in this recipe. But my girlfriend made these the other day and I thought they were so fantastic. We um, literally, celebrated my birthday at the hair salon and we had food and cocktails and this was one of the recipes that we were snacking on and it was so good that I kind of re revamped it did my own little version to it and it's so easy but what I really like about it is that you could eat so many spring rolls with vegetables and literally what's going to stop you is your fullness because they're low in fat, they're low in calories, and they're, you're going to be able to eat until you're full versus like, I ate so many chicken wings, my stomach feels sick from the grease and the sodium and whatever saucy, sugary stuff that was that was coating it. So what, when, whether you're watching a football game or basketball or, you know, the end of the Olympics, whatever, whatever your sport is, or maybe you just want to like sit down and have a good Netflix with with some company and have a snack by that isn't going to make you feel terrible and isn't going to make you feel guilt ridden for eating it. So with that, um, I'll make sure that we share this with everybody. Everybody will get a copy of it. Um, so these are just two pictures that I took of, took myself. I'm going to enlarge them here just a little so you all can see how pretty real food looks. So. I'm not the best spring roller, okay? Mine were a little long. Um, one of my friends commented that they looked a little phallic. <laughs> um, but, but what I say on the line you can see above the photos is they only need to taste better than they look, okay? At the end of the day, they're going in your belly and you need to be eating good, high fibrous, brightly colored food. And so everything that I put into this spring roll wrap was raw. Um, I, the middle, which are purple, are like a purple, red, and yellow carrots. I had a, some nice organic carrots. I used everything raw. I did orange pepper, yellow pepper, um, cucumber, and then I parboiled my asparagus. Um, you could par steam them as well, just to get them a little bit, not as raw. Um, and then we just rolled these up. My daughter had fun. She was in the kitchen watching. So the, once again, we're encouraging the younger generations to look about food and, and learn about food, touch food. So here's the recipe. If you wanna grab your phone and screenshot it, I'm gonna leave the ingredients here first. So you can see the rice paper rolls, most of the time you can find them at your grocery store or you're gonna be able to find them maybe in your ethnic aisle um, or if you have a really good Asian food market or Asian store around you, they're gonna be in plenty there. 
but they're the rice paper wrappers are really inexpensive. And what I did was I had a imagine an old brownie tray, right? A, any kind of dish that maybe has anything more than an inch in height. And I put some cold water in there. And then I went ahead, dropped the rice wrapper in there. And the rice wrappers are hard. And my tip is once they go into water, they start to obviously soften up. My trick, what I found was I was able to, if this was the rice wrapper, I, can you guys see me at all on my split screen? Okay, if I was, if my hand is the wrapper, I would put my fingers into the bowl and kind of move the wrapper like this. And when the wrapper felt hard, like it wasn't moving with me, I knew it needed to be in there longer. And when the wrapper felt, oh no, I feel like I should take it out of the water now, that was the perfect time to pull the wrapper out. And then I laid it onto my cutting board. I had to finagle it a little bit. Um, and you want to, if it's a square wrapper, you want to place it in a triangle. So the point is coming toward yourself. And then you're going to lay in however you, whatever wonderful brightly colored vegetables you have in your fridge are probably the good ones to start with. Don't need to go out. If we're all plant-based eaters, most of us are going to have some kind of raw vegetables in our fridge right now. Um, and you could start there. Asparagus is a wonderful spring vegetable. Um, we're going to start to see a lot of it come April and May. It'll start to come in plentiful. So those are your ingredients. I'm going to scroll down a little here and give you the peanut sauce. So pretty simple. Most of us have these ingredients or something similar at home. Um, if you are a peanut allergy person or someone in your house, you're moving away, you could easily replace the peanut butter with almond butter. Or if you wanted to go a step further, you could replace it with sunflower butter. And now you've eliminated all nuts and you're in the seed family. So our peanut butter is obviously going to have the most fat um, because it's got its omega-6s in it. That's probably our least healthy of our nut butters. But if you're someone like me who's trying to feed a toddler who is basically allergic to almost every other nut except for peanuts, <laughs> we do peanuts in my house. So, you know, think about your diet. Think about your dietary goals, and then you could decrease the sodium on this by decreasing your soy or tamari sauce. Um, and you could maybe add a little bit more vinegar if you wanted to bump up um, a little bit of that, boom, that zestiness that it's going to have. Um, so the sauce is pretty simple. I'm going to decrease here just a little bit more so you all can see the instructions there. Steps one through four, pretty simple. You can't really mess them up. The only way you could mess it up would be if your rice, the, the paper tore, um, and then you might want to discard it, and they're so inexpensive, get another one and kind of start again. Um, if you want to go to the air fryer version of this, I would recommend getting the, they're called egg roll wrappers, and they're typically found in the cooler section of where you're gonna find your tofu, um, your seitan, tofu noodles, different things like that. You know where those things are in your store that you're shopping. Find your, um, your egg roll wrappers and you're gonna roll everything exactly the same way that you would do with the rice paper, except now you're gonna tuck the corners, roll it up, right? So you don't want your ingredients to fall out. And then you're gonna put it in the air fryer if you're going no oil, it's totally fine. If you are okay with oil, a small little spray will help it get a nicer golden brown look, but you do not have to use oil with an air fryer. It's going to crisp up any way you like it, and that's going to give you a crispy version. Um, the rice paper one is going to give you a little bit more of a softer version. Um, the tip I will leave you with, and then I'll go to see if anybody has a question before we turn it over to Dr. Clapper is, Eat healthy when you're snacking. We don't have to snack on crap, right? There's probably some good veggies that are in there, but most of the time we're like, let me grab my raw veggies and let me grab my hummus. Um, so this is just a nice little variation. And if you like the peanut sauce, make some extra and you could use that to kind of dip other things in throughout the week. The tip I'm gonna leave you with is that if you leave the rice paper, let's say you made 20 of these and you left them out on your counter and only 10 were eaten, the rice paper will start to harden up again. So two hours later, you're gonna to go to pick up your soft 
um, wrap your spring roll and it might be a little crunchy on the outside. So it's going to lose its softness. So they, they pretty much need to be eaten um, pretty quickly. So that is our recipe. My, my, you know, I encourage you, just like I said, try and eat a little bit healthier. These are great snacky foods. Um, I love them because visibly they're beautiful and they say, eat me. So if you have other people around who maybe aren't on the plant-based bus already, they're going to look at these beautiful colors and say, I want to try this. So give it a try. I bet you'll enjoy it. Does anyone have any questions or does anyone have a recipe that they wanted to share? I did not hear from anybody. Um, I do see, I do see a question that. here, uh, Amberly, uh, from Donna. It's, okay. do you eat the rice paper raw or steam them? No, you don't want to eat it um, raw. You would want to put it in warm water or water and that water will reconstruct it. You could put it in steam, but it's going to steam so much quicker than it would as if you put it like in water. Um, that I feel like you have more control if it's in a little dish right next to you. I did one wrapper, rolled one, one wrapper, rolled one. So they're kind of not labor intensive, but I worked on one at a time. And so I feel like um, steaming it would happen really fast. Um, and you just have to keep a tighter eye on it. Uh, there's another uh, comment here uh, earlier from Mary Beth saying, uh, I'm really enjoying your plant joy home made plant-based meals delivered. Oh, thank you, Mary Beth. I really appreciate that. You know, it has been a real joy and a treat to continue to cook for everyone. Um, our business has been growing and we're delivering more places and I'm always looking for new ideas and new recipes. So I encourage, because I know that there are a lot of my customers that are on this call tonight, that if there's something that you really like or want to see on our menu, share with me because I like you, Oh, I'm in the plant-based arena, right? I'm trying to open my mind all to new ideas and things. And um, I'll give you an example. Um, I absolutely, there are certain things I don't like. And when I don't like things, like I don't like beets, I struggle to cook them. So someone asked me to make a borscht and soup. And I was like, never going to happen. Because I wouldn't even have the, the checks and balances to, to taste it, to know, is it good? Is it great? Is it... Um, but I'm learning. That's one of my learning curves as a chef is, is how do we uh, step outside of ourselves when we don't maybe like a certain um, ingredient profile or a flavor of things like that. Um, so thank you. I appreciate that. I love what I do and I get to do it for some great people. Uh, I did one other thing, Mary Beth, I think you had raised your hand during Dr. Liberman's talk. I don't know if you had a question or not. Um, do you want to... Um, if you do, if you want to unmute and ask it before we go to Dr. Clapper, that's no question for now. Okay, great. Okay. Thanks. And Everly, thanks so much. Yeah. Great, not uh, a great problem. recipe. I like the crunchy idea. Yeah, well, you know, if you're if you're gluten-free, the rice paper is the way to go, but a good little crunch. Um, you know, never hurt. And the air fryer is a really great way to do that. And you, even if you don't have an air fryer and you have a toaster oven, you probably could get the same kind of crunch um, through doing a little bit of um, hit it again, hit it again for 30 seconds, a little bit more broil. Uh, and you probably with a, a quick eye on it could get that same crunch in, a to in the toaster oven as well. So right. have a good night, everybody. And I'm looking forward to Dr. Clapper. So let's get there. Thanks, Emily. Uh our next speaker, and I should mention too, I did, uh, I'm sure most of you know this, but to see the uh, presentation on the wide screen, if you go up to, to the view portion of your uh, Zoom screen and hit speaker, um, that'll give you the, uh, uh, Dr. Clapper's presentation will take up uh, the whole screen instead of being just a little box among a bunch of other boxes. Uh, our featured speaker tonight is a plant-based icon. He's been a physician for, and I don't, didn't look this up, but close to 50 years? 50 years this year. Mm -hmm. Oh, congratulations on that. Uh, he's, uh, he's a pioneer in the use of plant-based nutrition and has helped thousands of people lead healthier, happier lives. He's also passionate, a passionate and devoted educator of physicians about the importance of nutrition in clinical practice. He's an author of books and articles, a regular speaker at healthcare conferences in and outside the U.S., He's been featured in healthcare documentaries, including What the Health, Cowspiracy, The Diet for New America, just to name a few of them. 
In 2007, he was given the Plantrician Project Luminary Award. Now, for those of you who don't know this award, this is the signature award given each year at the International Plant-Based Nutrition Healthcare Conference, conference of largely physicians, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it's given to an individual who's done an exemplary job during their career advancing whole food plant-based nutrition as the foundation of disease prevention, suspension, and reversal. Other winners of this award have been other giants in this field, such as Dr. Dean Ornish, Dr. T. Colin Campbell, Dr. Neil Barnard, and Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn. Uh, tonight, uh, Dr. Clapper will be speaking to us from Florida. It's a great pleasure to welcome our featured speaker tonight, Dr. Michael Clapper. Dr. Clapper? Well, thank you very much, Terry, for that lovely introduction. Uh, thank you all. I want to compliment Dr. Lieberman and, um, and our esteemed chef. Those are two excellent um, uh, presentations. Amberly, the, you know, a taste is worth a thousand words. And you put the food in their, in their mouths and, uh, oh, I could eat that. And you change someone's lives there. And, uh, and uh, I'm going to be speaking to uh, Dr. Lieberman's very important points that he made. So I feel I'm in good company. We're off to a great start. Uh, when uh, Terry asked me to uh, return as a speaker, I couldn't turn him down, not only because Terry is such a fine fellow and, 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 a, and an excellent leader of your organization. His passion, his focus uh, is really a real treasure for the Milwaukee community. Uh, but I have a soft spot in my heart for Wisconsin. Uh, in the 1950s, uh, during the polio epidemics, it would sweep through uh, the big cities. Uh, I lived in Chicago. Uh, my parents would uh, whisk me up every summer to the uh, my uncle's dairy farm up in uh, Langlade County, way up north in Eagle River, Rhinelander, Andigo country there. And I uh, spent my first 16 summers driving tractors and milking cows and slinging hay bales. Uh, and uh, it really shaped me. I got, uh, I encountered the natural world on the farm there and, uh, and a caring for animals and people. I think my physicianship was kindled on my uncle's farm there. Uh, and so, uh, and the forests of Wisconsin called to me. I spent many, many uh, days hiking in the forest, canoeing the woods, and uh, I have a deep emotional attachment to your state. Uh, and uh, my niece, uh, Rebecca, uh, is Professor uh, Rebecca Clapper, and she is the head of the uh, Freshwater Biology Laboratory in your fair city, uh, at uh, right where the Milwaukee River enters Lake Michigan, there's uh, UW who has its uh, Freshwater Biology Lab, and Rebecca is the head of that. And uh, so I said, Uncle Michael, uh, people take a lot of pills and, uh, in this city, in this society, and uh, goes right through their bodies and flush down the toilet and the rivers and streams of America are running with metformin and estrogens and beta blockers and uh, they affect the the minnows and the and the crayfish and little critters there and and she's and the might the what the nanoparticles uh, she's studying so uh, she's uh, she's kept very busy there and it gives me an excuse to come to Milwaukee uh, once a year or so. So I really, I uh, really love your city and the people there. So with that preface, uh, let me uh, share my screen and and give you a presentation. It will be a lot of the material will be familiar to many of you, but I put in a couple of points that uh, hopefully will make you say, "Hmm, I hadn't realized that." And if that is uh, successful, then I uh, will have accomplished my mission here. Let me uh, get rid of the. Uh, uh, of the video panel and the, uh, and the meeting controls. And then let me play the slideshow. Okay, <clears throat> uh, Terry, everybody, that looks good. Everybody can see. All right, great. Okay, let's uh, begin. <clears throat> uh, after 50 years of clinical medical practice, and I'm still doing active telemedicine, I'll tell you about that at the end, I'm still doing clinical medicine. Uh, but the focus in my life right now, my professional career, is to reach the medical students and to give them the lecture I wish someone had given me 50 years ago. That they, uh, and that I've been traveling around the country, in fact, and 
across North America, Canada, Mexico, Australia, New Zealand, Europe, I was in Poland, Lithuania, and with the same message that I tell the, the students, listen, in, in pathology class and physical diagnosis, you may be learning how to diagnose and treat all these weird and wonderful diseases from smallpox to leprosy. But when you get out in the real world and you open the door of the emergency room or your clinical medical practice, uh, the people you're going to see there uh, do not suffer from smallpox or leprosy, thank heavens. What you're going to see is a large group of people with a small group of degenerative diseases. Most are going to be overweight or clinically obese. You're going to see clogged arteries showing up as high blood pressure, angina, claudication, elevated lipids. You see rampant type two diabetes and a host of inflammatory diseases affecting every organ system from lungs to gut to joints to immune system. And uh, this is Western medicine in the 21st century. Uh, and yet when you ask your professors uh, or look in a textbook, if you still look at textbooks or go online, what is the cause of these diseases? You run into two words that seem to stop all further thought, etiology unknown. We don't know the cause of atherosclerosis. We don't know the cause of hypertension. And I will grant on the, on the finest molecular level, we've not teased out every single interaction between every gene and every enzyme. And yes, there's a world of discoveries that need to be made on that molecular level. But to think that the smart women and men working in those labs at NIH and Harvard are going to magically come up with a mesocillin and we're going to give it to our patients and restore them to glowing health. It's not going to happen. Etiology unknown. I tell the students there to abandon that hope for a mesocillin to rescue you and your patients. Uh, etiology unknown, what's the cause? Oh, look at what our patients are eating. And in the space of our, our my 50 year medical career, we become a fast food nation. Uh, and bacon and eggs for breakfast, cheeseburgers for lunch, chicken for dinner, ice cream for dessert. Now, I grant not everybody eats like this every meal, but most Americans have fast food meals often during the week. And I spend the first part of my lecture exploring the physiology and biochemistry of what happens when we eat such a diet. Uh, here's a, just a couple of quick summary slides. Now I tell the students, because they're really not aware of the effect that what their patients are, what their patient's diet is having on their bodies. Uh, <clears throat> I tell them, look, if you eat a whole food plant-based meal, here's a nice colorful salad and a hearty vegetable bean soup and some quinoa and zucchini boats and some steamed green and yellow vegetables. You eat a meal like this, and if an hour later I were to sneak up on you with a needle and a syringe, and when you weren't looking, I draw zip, five cc's of blood into a red top tube, let it clot and uh, put it in the centrifuge and spin it down. Uh, this is what we would see in nice clear serum. Uh, you can read newsprint through normal serum. This is what your blood should look like after you eat a fatty meal. But you have bacon eggs for breakfast or a cheeseburger for lunch or chicken or pizza for dinner. And I draw the same tube of blood an hour later. Uh, and this is what you would see. This creamy material is lipemia. It's fat in the blood. The blood stays this way for five hours. And the reality is, I tell the students, when you open the door in, your, in the waiting room of the ER or your clinic, most people are sitting there with blood that looks like this. Uh, we, we, we do not tolerate hunger in this society. Uh, if you, we're at all the munchy during the day, if you're home, you stick your head in the fridge for last night's leftovers. Uh, if you're out, you head for the convenience store or the restaurant. But uh, we, we keep ourselves in the after eating, the postprandial state, pretty much constantly. And most people are walking around with serum that looks like this. Uh, the, the fat has adverse effects. The salt from the meats and the cheeses and the chips have its own effect. All the sugar from the cola drinks and the baked goods uh, have detrimental effects. It's a whole lecture about what uh, keeping your blood full of fat and sugar does. Uh, and, and, and meat adds an entire new um, uh, tier of insults. And I go through a slide that uh, has the adverse effects of oxidized cholesterol and the carcinogens and the new 5GC and the endotoxin, all the things that come from meat. And, um, and 
most people are keeping their bloodstream pretty toxic during the day with the bacon and eggs for breakfast and blood stays fatty all morning and the cheeseburger for lunch keeps it fatty all afternoon and and the visit to the colonel uh, keeps the blood fatty all evening and the polishing off the ice cream on the way to the bed uh, keeps the blood fatty all day. Uh, this is a real disaster uh, for the bloodstream. And yet we don't mention this to our patients. We practice medicine like what our patients are eating has no effect on these diseases. Ooh, don't ask about what they eat. Ooh, that's cultural. Uh, yes, doctor, I tell the students, ask them about what they're eating because doctor, that's why they're sitting in front of you. Overweight, diabetic, hypertensive, clogged up and inflamed from what they're running through their bloodstream every four hours. And until you deal with that, you are putting yourself in the position of the blind men and the elephant. You probably remember the old fable, uh, a group of blind men stumble upon an elephant. One grabs the tail, so the elephant's like a rope. One grabs the trunk, oh, the elephant's like a snake. One grabs the leg, oh, the elephant's like a tree trunk. They all have hold of the same elephant but none of them has the faintest clue what a whole live elephant really looks like and what it really is. Well, that's the problem with our specialists, bless them, in their cubicles trying to figure out their respective diseases. And the cardiologist sees the clogged arteries and the physiatrist sees the sore joints and the internist sees the high blood pressure and the kidney failure. And the endocrinologist sees the type two diabetes and the rheumatologist sees the lupus. The dermatologist sees the psoriasis, the neurologist sees the dementia, the gastroenterologist sees the, uh, uh, the colitis, the Crohn's disease, the surgeon sees the colon cancer. They're all puzzled, hmm, all these different diseases. Gee, they have something in common. They all involve inflammation. They all involve free radical damage and oxidative stress. Hmm, what factor could be causing uh, all this inflammation and all these different diseases? makes me want to lovingly gather them up into a big football stadium, sit them down, grab the microphone and say, colleagues, what you're looking at is the effect of what your patients are eating, what they're running through their bloodstream every four hours, uh, pretty much 24 seven around uh, throughout the year here. It's what they're eating. Now, uh, now I will say in, in fairness, uh, the, you know, there might be a, an infectious cause. Some people think that the inflammation of rheumatoid arthritis in the joints is actually from a mycoplasma organism. And some people say that the, uh, the uh, uh, plaques that develop in the nervous system from multiple sclerosis, maybe it's a virus, might be. I'm not saying it's totally the food is the cause. But even if there's an infectious agent setting off the inflammation or the pathology in the, in the tissues, how hot that inflammatory fire burns, how much, uh, how much tissue damage is done in those joints and in those nervous systems largely depends on uh, the milieu that's been created in those tissues uh, from the daily diet. And the real crime, the real tragedy, if you will, uh, against the patient and the physician is that the patient is deprived, they're both deprived of the understanding that a diet based on whole plant foods will reverse these diseases. And I have several slides on exactly how this happens. Uh, uh, the, the, the very act of going to a diet based on whole plant foods pulls out uh, the, the disruptive molecules, the prostaglandin twos and the, uh, the arachidonic acid and the the uh, new 5GC and the endotoxin pulls out these insulting molecules, including the oxidized cholesterol, and floods the tissues with antioxidants and phytonutrients and water uh, and omega-3 fats that change the balance of inflammation in the tissues. They dilate the blood vessels. They allow the blood to flow uh, more freely, less viscous. Uh, it changes everything in the body, and people get healthier. And I remind the students that, look, within minutes of eating anything, molecules of that food are flowing through every cell in our body where your DNA lies unfolded, where all your genes are exposed. And the food molecules flow over the, uh, your, the your DNA and they play your genes like a piano. 
It, it turns genes on, turns genes off. It induces enzymes, it shut enzymes down. Food brings in not only nutrients, it brings in information. And you don't need to be a geneticist to understand that the genes that are going to be turned on by this broiled steak with all the oxidized fats and aldehydes and U5GC and endotoxin and, and the carcinogens and advanced glycation end products and biochemistry pesticides, the genes are going to be turned on by this toxic brew that we know the genes turn on aging and inflammation and autoimmunity and cancer. They're going to be a totally different set of genes than those that are going to be turned on by this salad that floods the tissues with antioxidants that quench free radicals with phytonutrients that stabilize membranes that promote tissue repair. In computer analogy, it's the difference between one and zero, an animal-based diet versus a plant-based diet. The, the, the biology, the chemistry is so profound. Your genes may load the gun, but your diet and your lifestyle pull the trigger. By the way, I hope you guys have your cameras handy and take a lot of pictures, especially towards the end of this. I'm going to give you lots of resources that you're going to want to remember, though this uh, presentation is being recorded and you can always go back, replay it, and stop the video where you need to freeze the frame. Uh, speaking of frames, this is a remarkable demonstration of the effects of the power of food. Uh, this left-hand panel... Uh, is a genetic readout from a man of pro with prostate cancer. Uh, and all these red dashes here, these are active oncogenes. These are genes that are turned on that actively promote the growth of the cancer. This man went on a whole food plant-based diet for six solid months, just ran lots of salads and soups and steamed veggies and bean chilies and Asian curries through his prostate gland, through his whole body. And six months later, they did another biopsy. Same man, same patient, same genes. And look at all the red oncogenes that have now been silenced, that are no longer promoting tissue growth. This is, or tumor growth. This is such a powerful modality. How, how can we withhold this from our patients? How, how can we not share this knowledge with them? It's really borders on unethical, not to mention this to our patients, the power they have with every choice, every bite matters, as the title of the talk says. Every meal changes us, uh, either directly, the way new 5GC will turn inflammation, but also the micro, the food that we eat changes the microbes in our gut and they change us. They make our gut membranes more permeable. They incite inflammation. They put out neurotransmitters. And especially over time, you eat three meals a day. That's a thousand times a year. You are flooding your tissues with uh, nutrients that either Im improve uh, cellular function or disrupt it. <clears throat> And I tell the med students, when you open the exam door to go in to see your patient, it's never uh, the exam room door. It's never just you and the patient. It's always you, the patient, and the patient's daily diet. That's the invisible sculptor that's chipping away at the inside of their arteries, at the beta cells of their pancreas that determine the, uh, uh, the diseases these folks uh, uh, bring to the doctor to uh, be improved. Uh, and again, um, even though it may seem culturally sensitive, uh, meet them where they're at and help them find uh, better alternatives. Send them to the plant-based dietitian. She or he will do the counseling and the doctor just gets to see, to see them back. Uh, it's so exciting to see um, a whole food plant-based diet reverse these diseases. I wish someone had told me this concept in med school. These are reversible diseases generally that you're going to be seeing. I practiced medicine for 40 years before anybody put these two words in the same sentence for me. Uh, and it should be common knowledge for both the patient and the doctor who should be uh, uh, bringing this to the patient's awareness that they have this power to reverse these diseases. You, you don't have to have high blood pressure the rest of your life. You don't have to have type 2 diabetes. You don't have to have lupus. Uh, again, we need to bring this good news to our patients. That's what I'm telling the patients and uh, the, the doctor, the students, and the young doctors who attend in our Moving Medicine Forward uh, program. And when patients, and you're probably well aware of this, uh, adopt a whole food plant-based diet, uh, the changes are often nothing short of spectacular. 
Within days, the obesity starts to melt away, insulin receptors open up, arteries relax, the blood's less viscous, increases oxygen delivery, uh, the joint pain often gets better, the asthmatic lungs wheeze less, the psoriatic skin begins to clear, bowel function normalizes. And you see patients like Dr. Furman's Emily here uh, look like this on 30 units of insulin and, uh, and two hypertensive medication. She went on a whole food plant-based diet. 11 months uh, of that kind of eating, this Emily turned into that Emily. Normal blood pressure, normal uh, blood glucose, offer medications. Uh, I tell the med students, what greater gift could you give your patients? What greater goal as a healer? Uh, could you want for your patients then help them make this transformation? And then I ask a challenging question, you know, do you want to heal these patients or don't you? Because if you just see them to raise their metformin dosage and raise their beta blocker dosage and say, ah, they're all getting fatter and sicker, they all going to need stents, which is what you'll see if you, if you don't talk to them about their diet, doctor, then you're going to leave medicine. Uh, the, it's, it's a dismal, hopeless kind of medicine to practice for both you and the patient. If you get them on a whole food plant-based diet, uh, it's the most exciting transformation in medicine. You'll become the happiest doctor you know. I'm the happiest doctor I know. My patients get healthy right before my eyes. So let's talk about two diseases. Uh, if, if every bite counts. If you want to prevent or reverse type two diabetes, uh, let's talk about it. <clears throat> uh, well, yes, Mary Beth, we'll get to your question at the end. I'm uh, hustling right through this. Uh, the material as quickly as I can, but I make it clear to the med students that this type 2 diabetes is a reversible disease. Uh, here's the basic mechanism. Uh, here's a muscle cell that normally burns sugar. When sugar shows up in the, uh, in the bloodstream, uh, the pancreas releases insulin, uh, and insulin uh, uh, sends the signal to, to let glucose into the muscle cell, the liver cell, where it's burned for energy. That's the way it should work. But if you're keeping your blood fatty on the standard American diet, then uh, fat works its way into the muscle cell and interferes with the insulin receptors. Uh, and uh, this is not theoretical. This is real stuff. Here's what it looks like uh, under the light microscope. This is striated muscle uh, and this black stuff. This is fat in the muscle cell, intramyocellular lipid. Uh, here's what it looks like under the electron microscope. Uh, and for the scientists in the, in the room there, what's really happening is normally uh, insulin uh, activates two kinase enzyme, this K and this K, and that activates the GLUT4 transport mechanism that pulls sugar into the cell for it to be burned. But if the fat in the muscle cell has loaded up the mitochondria that has been oxidized to free radicals and ceramides. They inhibit these two uh, kinase enzymes. So insulin knocks on the door, but nobody answers. Nobody lets the glucose in. So it piles up in the bloodstream. And obesity makes it worse. Uh, here you see these uh, kinase enzymes interfered by the fat on the inside. And an, an obese abdomen is going to put out inflammatory cytokines that interfere uh, with the insulin receptors from the outside. No wonder so many obese people become, uh, uh, become uh, developing type 2 diabetes. Uh, Dr. Lieberman mentioned uh, animal protein plays a role here. Heme, iron plays a role. Yes, yes. That's all true. I'm focusing on the fat here, but there, it's all of a piece. If you're eating meat, you're eating heme iron, you're eating animal protein, you're eating fat. Uh, and uh, the science behind this is quite solid. Uh, and again, the uh, visceral fat releases inflammatory cytokines uh, that, uh, that, makes the, uh, uh, that interferes with the insulin receptors. Again, this is a preventable disease. You raise a child on a plant-based diet, they never become obese, they never develop type 2 diabetes, but you, if you already have it, this is absolutely reversible. Uh, keep your belly full of foods like this. Uh, and uh, the fat in the muscle cells burn for energy. And as the obesity melts away, the inflammatory cytokines disappear. And as a result, the insulin receptors open up uh, and, the, and the diabetes reverses. Uh, there's studies showing this. You can research this if you'd like. Uh, <clears throat> compared to the American Diabetes Association diet, uh, plant-based diet gives a better reduction in hemoglobin A1C. As Dr. Lieberman talked about, they lose more weight, their lipids improve more, their uh, uh, kidneys improve. 
<laughs> and, uh, and people with type 2 diabetes, like Jim here, 100 pounds overweight, went on a whole food plant-based diet, uh, lost, uh, lost the abdominal body fat, lost his diabetes, he's off insulin, and now he's running marathons. <clears throat> um, uh, if you, if, if this is of interest, if you have type two diabetes, you, uh, you uh, are treating patients with that, uh, go to the, check out the program Mastering Diabetes at masteringdiabetes.org. Uh, you'll get lots of guidance there uh, to uh, how to learn, how to re uh, reverse diabetes. <clears throat> if you're looking for a plant-based doctor, I work for plant-based telehealth. Um, we are real doctors, we, uh, and we deep prescribe diabetes medications. Um, I don't have a Wisconsin license, but several of our doctors do that we all know the same stuff and we can help you uh, or your loved ones uh, get off uh, diabetes medication from type two diabetes. Um, the second disease, because I wanna get to the planet in a minute. Uh, the uh, second disease, and leave time for questions is atherosclerotic blockages in the heart. Every bite absolutely counts. <clears throat> it's our biggest killer. Every 40 seconds, uh, someone uh, grabs their chest and falls over the heart attack because this inflammatory plaque is uh, uh, clogging up their arteries. Uh, and the plaque can rupture, exposing the cholesterol. This sets off a clot that stops the blood flow in the heart, um, causing a heart attack or in the brain, causing a stroke. Uh, um, this person has all this white scarring here. These are all mini strokes from, from clots uh, that have happened uh, in the brain arteries. It's present in virtually all Americans who've been eating the standard Western diet. Marathon runners are not protected. If they're eating a junk food diet, their arteries are in just in bad of shape. You can't burn this out of your artery walls with a 20 mile run. <clears throat> and um, all vegetable oils uh, paralyze the the arteries ability to dilate, uh, even on vaunted olive oil. Uh, so let me get some specifics here. When you go to the cardiologist, you just get questions with numbers for answers. How high is your cholesterol? What's your particle size? What's your ratio? Questions, questions, questions. To me, and Dr. Lieberman as a cardiologist might take exception with this, but to me, the question is not how high is your cholesterol? Question is, how healthy are arteries? <clears throat> this is an inflammatory process. There's an inflammatory fire burning in the walls of the arteries. Do you have this disease or don't you? And just knowing your cholesterol number or your LDL number will not tell you if you've got this inflammatory fire burning in the walls of your arteries. <clears throat> The formation of atherosclerotic plaque is an inflammatory process. We're going to be going over this in a little detail in a minute. Um, but um, if it's an infl inflammatory process, what sets off the inflammation? Well, first, the precious endothelial lining of the arteries that Dr. Esselstyn uh, talked to us about, uh, they get injured. What injures the endothelial lining? what comes into the bloodstream every four hours from eating the standard Western diet, bacon and eggs, cheeseburgers, uh, et cetera. Look what flushes through the bloodstream every, with every sad uh, standard American diet meal, free radicals from the fried chicken and the grilled uh, burger there, the frying oil from the French fries and onion rings are full of free radicals, the processed foods, the chips, etc., full of advanced glycation end products and free radicals, um, cooking meat and uh, cooking sugar in the bakery produces advanced glycation end products full of free radicals that damage the endothelial lining, the food chemicals, the colorings and the yellow number three dye and then tartrazine. Uh, injure the endothelial lining, the sugars, the high fructose corn syrup and the cola drinks and in the candies, the uric acid from meat consumption, phosphoric acid and cola drinks, all this flushes through the, the, the bloodstream after every meal. And then there's what we breathe in, the air pollution, the secondhand cigarette smoke from the sports bar, the high cortisol levels from our stress. The, the, it's a damaging kind of chemistry that we inflict upon the blood that then damages the arteries. Well, what about your cholesterol though? Isn't that, doesn't that, isn't that a role? Let me just clarify that cholesterol is not an evil molecule to be struck down at every chance with statins. 
your liver makes cholesterol and it does so for a reason. Your adrenal glands use uh, cholesterol to create st uh, steroids that are needed for survival. Your liver makes uh, cholesterol to turn into bile that lets you absorb your fats. Your ovaries, if you got them, uh, makes estrogen out of cholesterol. Your testes, if you got them, makes testosterone out of cholesterol. Every cell in your body uses cholesterol to construct its cell membranes. Uh, and cholesterol is used as, a, as storage docking uh, stations for omega-3 fats in our blood. <clears throat> and so, uh, and I've got lots of vegans walking around with cholesterol at 210. I get I get calls every month from plant eating folk. I just got my cholesterol bag is 208. I thought it was going to drop to 150 and it's still 190. And my doctor wants to put me on statins. I don't want to go on statins, but my numbers are high. I call this the tyranny of the numbers. We give these uh, numbers more power than they deserve. The real issue is not cholesterol. As I mentioned, your liver makes it for a reason. Real issue is oxidized cholesterol. What is oxidized cholesterol? This cholesterol has had a couple of electrons ripped off of it because in the bloodstream, there's a lot of oxidizing molecules that will rip, cholesterol, uh, rip electrons off the cholesterol in your blood. But I think the largest source of, of oxidized cholesterol molecules <clears throat> is the very act of grilling the, the chicken breast or broiling the steak. You are you know, cooking the animal muscle full of cholesterol under a flame at 400, 500 degrees. You're gonna oxidize a lot of cholesterol and then you eat the burger, you eat the chicken breast, you eat the steak and you flood the bloodstream full of oxidized cholesterol, cholesterol oxides. They're like the rust on a car, the oxidized cholesterol. And it's the oxidized LDL that gets into the artery walls that induces an inflammatory reaction that pulls in the macrophages from the blood uh, to uh, engulf the oxidized LDL particles uh, and to churn out tremendous amount of free radicals, re reactive oxygen species. And this is what does the damage. This is the, the atherosclerotic plaque is the body's artery walls response to the oxidized cholesterol, the free radicals, the inflammatory fire burning in the walls of the arteries. Now, let me just say that the, the cardiologist who opens his door in the waiting room and looks and sees um, Joe um, and Mr. American with their uh, obese abdomen and elevated lipids, oh, they're all at risk, they all got high cholesterol, they're all going to get heart attacks and strokes. That's right, doctor, they will if you don't have them change their diet to a plant-based one. But I just want to bring out to, clearly that all the risk statistics that correlate elevated cholesterol levels with atherosclerosis and heart attacks and strokes are derived from and apply to people eating the animal-based standard American diet. These are not derived from people eating whole food plant-based diets. And what I'm saying is that a diet of rice and beans and greens and fruits and veggies running through your bloodstream on a daily basis should not injure your arteries or make you obese or set you up for a heart attack. <clears throat> if you're eating a whole food plant-based diet and your cholesterol is 190 or 210, remember that, that if you've gotten on the plant-based train, then every one of those cholesterol molecules were put there by your liver for its own reasons, for steroid synthesis, for sex hormone synthesis, it's different than the animal eater where every other cholesterol molecule in their bloodstream after eating their burger or their buffalo wings is chicken cholesterol, cow cholesterol with all the free radicals and, and French fry vegetable oil and the, that destructive milieu that goes on to ignite and sustain that inflammatory fire. <clears throat> Those are not the same situations. The, those are different biological people with different biological processes going in their arteries. <clears throat> so for the plant eaters, if you're really eating, and when I say rice and beans and greens and fruits and veggies, I'm talking about the whole food plant-based diet that we're promoting here. If that's really what you're eating and your cholesterol is 190 or 204, um, trust your liver, it knows what it's doing. 
Now, but make sure your diet is not inflammatory. Make sure it's not full of junky sugars and fried processed vegan junk foods and all of that. But rice and beans and greens and fruits and veggies shouldn't enter your arteries. It shouldn't injure your arteries. But do have your inflammatory markers check. When people, when those vegans come to me with quote elevated cholesterol, I want to say more than that. I want to know your inflammatory markers. Uh, here is the progression of markers that show up in the blood, and and Quest Diagnostics and LabCorp are happy to do these. Any doc can order these; they're commonly done nowadays. But rather, you know, than just your uh, cholesterol level, I want to know your oxidized LDL level. Tell me that um, as the uh, endothelial lining gets injured and the artery wall starts to get inflamed, then markers like prostaglandin 2, high sensitivity CRP show up, microalbumin starts showing up in the urine. And, and as the plaque starts to soften and get ready to rupture, uh, and, uh, markers like myeloperoxidase and phospholipase show up. Uh, I want to know these numbers uh, to answer that question. Again, not just how high is your cholesterol, how healthy your artery walls. Tell me these numbers, and I can tell you how healthy your artery walls are. And if there's any question, I'll send you over to the ultrasound store where they'll do an ultrasound scan. And if your arteries are look like this with nice, lovely, healthy, unthickened artery walls and nice laminar flow, you don't have a bunch of plaque sticking up, creating lots of eddies and swirls that would clot your blood. Uh, if your arteries look like this and your inflammatory markers are nice and low, uh, you don't have the disease as far as I'm concerned. And if your calcium score is elevated, but you're now in the plant-based train and you're really plant-based, don't worry about this. This is the markers of the fire, the inflammatory fire in years past. But, it, but if you've changed your diet, that doesn't hold much uh, import for you um, on the plant-based train. So, uh, so my classic vegan patient now, lean, healthy guy, runner, but with a cholesterol 218, but nice negative inflammatory markers and a normal ultrasound of his arteries. Should this man be taking statins? Uh, we don't know that you know, the only study that will answer that is uh, to um, <clears throat> take a thousand vegans eating a plant-based diet uh, with elevated cholesterols, put half of them on a dose of a low-grade statin, rosuvastatin three times a week, uh, and the other uh, group of placebo and follow them for 20 years and see who gets the heart attacks and who gets the strokes. That study hasn't been done. It probably won't be done. So we don't really have the definitive answer. And if a patient tells me, doc, uh, I'm uneasy about these numbers, I'd feel better on a low dose statin. I have no problems putting them on the statin. But if he says, doc, I do not want to go on medications. My inflammatory markers are negative. My, my arteries are clear on scan. I don't want to go on, on statins. I think that is an absolutely reasonable uh, course to follow. So in summary, if, the, if your markers of inflammatory inflammation are negative, you might want to take a picture of this. Um, uh, and uh, these are all negative. Your uh, ultrasound scan is clear. Uh, uh, keep eating healthy. Um, uh, make sure you got enough iodine and selenium for your thyroid to work well. Um, and if you want to lower those numbers, look up the portfolio diet by David Jenkins. Uh, more oatmeal plant sterols can lower those numbers even more. But again, uh, don't be chasing numbers if you know your arteries are healthy. <clears throat> if you if your these come back positive then you need to jump on Dr. Esselstyn's uh, uh, program to reverse heart disease and follow it to the letter. It is, uh, it is absolutely uh, reversible uh, and it's the dark green leafies that have the magic. Uh, you keep these in your bloodstream pretty constantly, eat them three, four times a day if you're trying to melt plaques away. Uh, the antioxidants seep into the artery walls. Uh, they neutralize the free radicals, so the, the macrophages don't have to. As a result, the macrophages, the foam cells, they outmigrate. The plaques become smaller and smaller and smaller. That, that bruised up endothelial lining reestablishes itself, not by magic, because your bone marrow is putting out stem cells that uh, reupholster the arteries with nice, uh, uh, healthy uh, tissues there. And you've all seen this, this uh, arteriogram by now, but if you haven't, 
Now, this is the left anterior descending artery of the heart of a man who had severe angina. The whole artery should look like this die column, but this rat eaten pores, these are atherosclerotic plaques encroaching into the die column. Person goes on a whole food plant based diet, and this salad after soup, after steamed veggies for, for 32 months, and uh, the plaques melt away. This artery turns into this artery. Same patient, same artery. How can we withhold this information from our patients? Uh, arteries all over the body open up, much to the delight of people at home. And be sure to put uh, uh, balsamic vinegar on your greens. It activates the nitric oxide uh, that uh, helps the vasodilation. Uh, all my patients get my uh, four-page handout on how to reverse diseases. I've given this to Terry. He'll be more than happy uh, to send this to you. You can modify this uh, to suit your own needs. Now, it's not too late. It's not too difficult. If you haven't seen Forks Over Knives, see it. Go back to their website. They got great transition plans there. Um, a word about paleo diets. We are we have basically the same digestive system that our bonobo and uh, uh, and uh, gorilla cousins have. Uh, uh, but the paleo folks eat say, eat like a caveman, uh, uh, even though they only lived to be age forty. Eat like a caveman because they like the taste of meat in their mouth. There's meat and low starch vegetables. Um, uh, they say, look, we got canine teeth. That tell that says we should be eating meat. To which I say, look in the mirror, open your mouth, and you'll see that your canine teeth here are shorter than your central incisors. Um, there makes them useless for jumping on the back of a cow and trying to tear through its hide. You want to see some uh, canines meant to tear flesh? Have your house cat open its mouth there. If, you, if your canines look like this, uh, go eat a uh, go into any butcher shop, buy a porterhouse steak, walk out on the curb, rip off the paper and have at it when don't bother to cook it. If you don't have canines like this, stop kidding yourself. What are these for? It's for eating the food that really got us through the Paleolithic time. When we examine the feces of these, uh, the, the massive feces these Paleolithic folks were passing, you see the huge amounts of fiber they were eating because most calories in the Paleolithic camp were brought in by the women who spent all day foraging for starchy roots and tubers that we could then boil up in boiling water with the advent of fire. Uh, and this is what got us through the Paleolithic time. And, and, our, and our canine teeth are excellent for biting into starchy roots and tubers and fruits. Uh, and our flat grinding molar teeth are great for grinding them up. Uh, now the paleo docs say, hey, my patients get better on a paleo diet. And they do. If you stop the dairy and the oil and the flowers, like the paleo folks say, caveman never ate, people get, they lose weight. And the weight loss will improve their lipids and improve their diabetes. But I say to these young docs, look, if you're telling your patients to pack their full intestines full of meat three times a day, you are setting them up for an epidemic of colon cancer and heart attacks and strokes from all the TMAO this is in their blood this is spawning. You know, you're gonna give them leaky guts, you're gonna give them lupus and autoimmune diseases. All the fats and meat is gonna give them type two diabetes. You're gonna spawn microbes in their gut that's gonna give them colitis and Crohn's disease. And, and this and all the AGEs uh, that the cooked meat has damages the arteries in their brain setting them up for dementia. Um, and these doc, young docs, this is drive-by nutrition advice. They're not going to be around in 15 years when these people pass their bloody stools and their colon cancer or have their stroke. Uh, I say these docs really know what they're doing when they recommend this style of eating. Uh, and very importantly, and finally, every bite counts. You want to preserve a lovable planet for yourself and your children because what would happen if everybody followed the paleo docs advice? Everybody, let's have a meat-based diet for, for a meat-based meal three times a day for 8 billion people. Uh, man, it doesn't matter. It's going to destroy this planet. And it doesn't matter what your cholesterol level is if we don't have a viable planet to live on. We raise and slaughter 80, living creature, 80 billion living creatures Every year on this planet, cows, pigs, goats, chickens, we cut their throats uh, every, by the hundreds of millions every day. And as a result, the planet is getting hotter. The, uh, the ice caps are melting, uh, largely due 
the, to uh, large scale industrial animal agriculture. That's why they're cutting down the forest. Most soil is eroding off corn and soybean fields, uh, growing animal fodder to shovel down the gullets of these animals to make cheap cheeseburgers. Most pollution, water pollution is driven by animal manure, herbicides and pesticides to grow animal fodder. Most species are being driven extinct by expanding our farming and uh, and most uh, these 80 billion animals are all breathing out carbon dioxide. They're belching out methane. Uh, they're eating grain sprayed, uh, grown with ammonia fertilizers. They put nitrous oxide into the air. I urge you, uh, educate yourself. Um, uh, every bite matters. Go to comfortablyunaware.com and see the videos and read the books. We've used Meat Eating Up. Please get Glenn Mercer's skinny little book, 60 pages. You can read it in an evening, Food is Climate. And he responds to Al Gore and Bill Gates. The answer is not electric cars and solar panels. Uh, it's changing our diet. Please see this film, Eating Our Way to, to Extinction. It will stun you and educate you. Uh, it's available on streaming on all these media. Uh, please see this film. Have a, have a movie night at your house and show it to your, uh, your meat-eating friends. And well, just eating fish is, was not the answer. We are clear cutting the ocean. We are strip mining the ocean. Uh, see the film Sea Spiracy. It will make it very clear. We've used fishing up. It's time we've used the oceans up. It's time to let them heal. It's time to leave caveman thinking behind. What if we do? We need so much less land to feed ourselves. The forest would come back. And as the trees grow, they take carbon dioxide out of the air and make it a solid wood. Uh, so the global warming would reverse, the soils would stabilize, the rivers would run clean again, the land would become healthy, people would become healthy. <clears throat> we need so much less land to grow our food. The, the, the land now needed to grow the food for one meat-eating person, two football fields worth, uh, could feed six, 14 people if you grow the plants and, and feed them the fruits and vegetables directly. Since uh, the white man came here and started cutting down the forest uh, and burning them, we've released 240 billion tons, 140 gigatons uh, uh, into the uh, of carbon dioxide into the into the atmosphere. Uh, <clears throat> If the world went vegan overnight, it would, we'd need so much less land, it would free up land the size of Africa, and we'd only need a quarter of that land to grow our food. That would allow uh, three quarters of the land to uh, let the trees come back. If only half of the, that land uh, allowed the trees to come back, it would save our futures. <laughs> uh, trees growing back on just half the land that would be freed up would sequester 256 gigatons of carbon dioxide. We've only released 240 gigatons since we started, since the Industrial Revolution. It would, it would save us. We don't need carbon capture machines. Nature already invented them. They're called trees. Um, so um, I, I urge you, educate yourself. If you don't know John Robbins' book, Die from America, read that. Uh, again, completely unaware. Um, <clears throat> now, what about the farmers and the ranchers? Uh, and Wisconsin's a dairy state. What, what about all the dairy farmers? Um, it, our economy will thrive. Um, we're going to be spending trillions anyway on climate change. We could use that um, to fix the roads, provide scholarships, use it, provide internet for everyone. And it costs nothing to choose the bean chili instead of the beef chili, okay? But so much would get better. So what would happen to all the, the Wisconsin dairy farmers? Uh, what about them? Let's help them do something else with their land. You don't have to run dairy operation. You don't have to run beef cattle on it. Do something else. Grow vegetables, grow industrial hemp, grow fruit trees, grow forests. Pay, pay them to let the forest come back. You can do agroforestry, planting veggies in between the trees. There's so much else to do. Let's help the farmers and ranchers. Now, they're, they're not the enemy. They're our brothers and sisters growing our food. Let's build one last aircraft, one less aircraft carrier, and use those billions to establish the farmers and ranchers 
transition administration. Let's help these people. Send them to community college, learn how to grow the new crops, uh, then buy their equipment for them, buy their seeds for them, give them crop insurance, send their kids to college, pay the mortgage on their house for 10 years, make it easy for them. Don't, hurt, don't, don't punish them, don't grind them up. And if you want to make this a reality, there, there, there are people working to help this transition happen. <clears throat> uh, check out the Agricultural Fairness Alliance, the AFA.farm. Uh, go there and you'll see there are lobbyists in Washington helping to craft legislation to help the farmers and ranchers make this very transition. So let's not trade in the future of our kids and our grandchildren. You got kids, you got grandchildren. Let's not trade their future in for Hugh Ham hamburgers. So every bite certainly counts if you want to preserve a livable planet for yourself and the children and their children. If you want to learn more about what, what we're doing uh, and help our efforts and want to make a tax deductible do donation, um, uh, go to drclapper.com and click on Moving Medicine Forward. Uh, I've got a YouTube channel um, and uh, I do Q and A's every week. Uh, feel free to visit me there. Thank you so much. Uh, as a reminder to everybody, our next monthly meeting will be Thursday, April 14th at 6 p.m. with Denver cardiologist, Dr. Andrew Freeman. If you'd like to receive notice of uh, upcoming PBNL events, go to pbnow.org and hit click the learn more button, register, and then you'll be on the list to receive info. If you'd like to check out past meeting videos, go to YouTube under pbnow.org uh, and then uh, look up or you can hit the, there's a little green um, uh, circle with a plant in it. If you hit that, you go to our, uh, our uh, YouTube page and uh, lots of videos up there. Thank you again, Dr. Clapper, Dr. Liberman, and Amberly for sharing your time and valuable knowledge with us tonight. Good night and thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs>